This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. Welcome to the latest in our Luncheons with Leaders series. I trust you all had a restful holiday season with your families, where it was stressful, chaotic, and terrifying. Uh, either way, you're prepared for the rigors of a new year and semester. You've cleared your head and sharpened the saw, or you've gotten into a rhythm with attention, confusion, and alarm that will probably happen a lot throughout this year. Either way, it's very useful. Well, we have a really special program ahead of us, one that celebrates courage, physical acts of courage that we have admired since the days of Homer and Herodotus, and political acts of courage that we forever seek in our public officials. It will also celebrate service, that awesome mixture of duty, honor, and love that inspires many in this room to direct their energy toward improving the well-being of others. In just a moment, I'm going to welcome Gleaves Whitney up to the podium to introduce today's guests, Doug, Stephen, and John Roberts. But first, I would just like to remind you all about a few uh, events we have coming up here in the month of January at the Hauenstein Center. Uh, first of all, tomorrow night, right back in this room at 7.30 p.m., we have our holiday mixer that everybody is welcome at. If you have not RCP, just please let us know if you'd like to attend. Uh, and that should be a, a whole lot of fun. Again, that's right back here at 7.30 p.m. Uh, then on January 19th, we have a week that, or we have an event that will be part of Leadership Week here at the university called Building Our Future. And really, it's just a program to try to promote the Leadership Fellows program and try to bring in some new colleagues for you all next year. Uh, so Mandy Bird has put out a yellow legal pad for you all. And please take a moment, if you can, at the end of the event today uh, to write down the names of a few of your friends or colleagues that would be interested in the program, and we'll get in contact with them with a personal invitation. Uh, then on January 19th and the 25th, both in the evening, uh, we have the next installments of our book club, our leadership book club, and our film series. Uh, the book club this, this semester will be exploring Malcolm uh, Gladwell's Outliers. So if you'd like to get involved in, in that, have a talk with Austin Nuppie before you leave today. And the next film series event will uh, screen and discuss Gran Torino. So talk with Kathy Runt if you're interested in that. And then finally, rounding out the month, you all had flyers when you sat down today. On January 20th and 29th, we have our Grand Valley Healthcare Summit, uh, Healthcare Reform Summit that we're hosting, which is bringing together just a great series of speakers from all over the country, from Brookings and Cato and, and American Enterprise Institute, U of M and elsewhere. And uh, I would just encourage you to, to sign up on our website, www.allpresidents.org, and come ready to participate, come ready to engage. Without further uh, delay, I'd like to welcome Gleaves up to the podium. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Well, I want to second what Brian said about today being a particularly special day. We have many special presentations. As you know, those of you who come to the Luncheons with Leaders program, but <clears throat> today, first of all, <clears throat> in sheer numbers, we're going to overpower some of the other programs by having three people. But it's also the quality of these people. I can't think of a, of, a, of a trio who have given more to the Republic as a family that we've been exposed to here at the Hallenstein Center. It's really quite a remarkable group of public servants. I'd like first to uh, introduce my friend and colleague of many years, Doug Roberts. Uh, when I think of Doug, he's sort of the all the president's men part of this uh, this presentation today. Doug serves as professor and director for the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research at Michigan State. He holds more than 28 years of experience in Michigan government, including 10 years as state treasurer, time as director of the Senate Fiscal Agency, deputy superintendent of the Department of Education, deputy director of the Department of Management and Budget, and acting director of DMB. He played a major role in the creation and adoption of what is now called Proposal A. He also served for two years as a vice president with Lockheed Martin. He holds doctorate and master's degrees in economics from MSU. Uh, he's got a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Maryland. Our next speaker is going to be his son, son Steve Roberts. Uh, John Roberts, pardon me. John currently serves as director of the Michigan House of Representatives Republican Policy Office. And when I was speaking with John before our lunch, I got a very interesting view on uh, the state budget process and the prospects for higher education. So he might uh, 
be able to share some interesting insights into that process. But before uh, returning to Michigan, John served as special assistant to the President for Intergovernmental Affairs in the White House. In this capacity, he served as the principal federal liaison to state legislators across the nation and other government officials. John was responsible for ensuring state priorities were incorporated into the White House policy discussions. He also served in the Office of Management and Budget and began his White House career in the Office of the Press Secretary. During his tenure with the Office of the Press Secretary, he was responsible for press logistics for all the presidential travel. He worked directly for two press secretaries, Scott McClellan and Tony Snow. And I can tell you this, John gives a hell of a tour of the West Wing. He's sort of the, uh, what I call, in fact, if, if Doug Roberts is the all the president's men guy, uh, John Roberts is the West Wing guy today. Our third speaker, <clears throat> Doug's brother, John's uncle, Steve Roberts, is sort of the hunt for Red October guy that we have with us today. <laughs> Steve is a retired U.S. Navy pilot with an incredible career. Most of his operational flying involved tra tra uh, tracking <clears throat> Soviet ballistic missile submarines during the height of the Cold War. He also flew missions in support of the Iranian hostage crisis and supported the Marines during the Lebanon bombing incident. His other flying assignments included a tour as a Navy instructor pilot in drug interdiction operations in the Caribbean. Steve currently works for Bank of America, where he supports business continuity and contingency planning. He received his undergraduate degree in business administration from Ohio State and a master's from Troy State. And he currently lives in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, and he came up here and told me to get out of the cold in Florida. Well, without further ado, I would like to bring up Doug Roberts. Thank you. Please, thank you very much for really an outstanding introduction. I'm, I'm really very moved by it. Um, I am also moved by looking at this audience and seeing uh, such a large number of people that are interested in family photos. Uh, it's not something that I would have necessarily shown up for, but hopefully we will give you a, uh, uh, a good uh, view of the White House over a number of years. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about um, my father. His name was Emery Roberts. Uh, he was uh, uh, born uh, in uh, 1914. Um, he died 58 years later, but during that period of time, his, he was in the Secret Service for approximately 30 years. Started with uh, President Roosevelt and ended with President Nixon. Uh, to my knowledge, he has served more presidents in executive protection than any other uh, person in the history of the Secret Service. Uh, and I will go through a number of photos that we have of his career to give you some idea of what he saw in his life. Um, and, and that in itself, I mean, it was really a witness to history. Um, I will also use a little bit of a DVD issue. This is some shows that were on TV. Uh, and I will uh, talk more about that later. Following my presentation, uh, my son John will then talk about his experience in the White House. And the last, my brother Steve will come up and tell some stories. Frankly, that's going to be the highlight because um, I am six years older. Now that's important, more important than you think, because I was older, I got married, I left the house. Um, our father did not speak about very many things, but when he retired, he did not retire very long before he passed away he was more willing to talk about stories. And so Steve has all the stories. And so we will let him tell um, uh, the stories. So if I could begin. Um, I am really very pleased to begin with this very first um, chart or, or photo. Um, this is a 1945. Uh, this is uh, President uh, uh, Truman. There. That is Winston Churchill. And there is my father, Emery Roberts. Now, if you're using, I'll just refer to him as either Agent Roberts or Emery Roberts. Um, the reason this is so important is because, of course, it's a very important point in history. I mean, Potsdam was at the end of the war. This is when the, the world was really being divided up. And Churchill, in fact, lost his position there because he was defeated in an election. 
and uh, another prime minister took over. But, I mean, this is the beginning of a type of world. Um, our father did begin uh, working for Roosevelt, and my brother Steve will mention the story, but we don't have any photos of, uh, of our father with Roosevelt, so that's the reason I'm beginning with Churchill. Next. Um, this is interesting because this is just the cover page of a magazine called Trains. Um, and this is um, 1949, and Truman is on the campaign, a very famous campaign trail where he took a train around. And uh, as you see with the arrow, that's uh, Emory Roberts. So he was protecting uh, Truman at that time. Next. This is just a, a crowd scene, again, uh, with a typical example. And you will see this over and over again, from president to president to president. And that's the story that I'm really telling. It's not that one person was protecting the president, but he had the opportunity to see so much and to see so many presidents. Um, next. This one is not well seen, but I'm just going to have to tell you about it. This was just recently found. This is in a newspaper in Massachusetts in 1952. And, I, I, and it just says that one of the president's constant companions, and it says a Secret Service man, and that you see the red arrow, and that's Emory Roberts. And then it goes on to say, who's in this car? Well, in this car is then President Truman, OK? Representative McCormick future Speaker of the House, Representative Kennedy, future President of the United States. I mean, you want to talk a powerful car. This was even before eight cylinders were invented. I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is a very, so I'm really very proud. This is really sort of a special picture. Next. This is a typical scene. This is now with President Eisenhower. Uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles motorcade, and you'll see again, Secret Service agents often either in cars or running along the side, and this is with, uh, uh, with Eisenhower. Next. I really like this one. This is, again, one of my very favorite photos. Um, this is in France. It's the suburb residence of Charles de Gaulle, and uh, we have uh, President Eisenhower, Charles de Gaulle, and uh, Emory Roberts. And it's just, I mean, again, I try to have more than one figure in some of these. Um, this is world history. I mean, this is about uh, going on, and we have uh, what he saw uh, during that time next. It's, this is just a stroll, same place, uh, same several residents. Uh, Charles de Gaulle again uh, with Eisenhower and our, our father in the background with the red arrow. Um, during the Eisenhower years, um, uh, Emory Roberts was also assigned periodically to protect then Vice President uh, Nixon. And you, I mean, there's so many stories that we don't have time for them, but see, Secret Service agent protection was so much different. I mean, it's almost like night and day. Uh, my father was one of four agents that went with Vice President Nixon and his wife on a around the world tour. Four agents. Now, you can't protect anything with four agents because you have one agent ahead of your stop, sort of making sure everything is okay. You got one agent behind you, sort of cleaning up any mess, which means you're traveling with two. Wait a second, they're 24 hours in a day. I mean, you got 12 hour shifts, and that's leaving one person. So, I mean, you really not, this is, uh, I, have, I don't know how to put this, uh, this is really go along with. Protection is rel relatively small. They did get help from local officials. I'm not arguing they didn't do it. But they only went with four agents. And so this was with then Vice President Nixon uh, in Casablanca in 1953. Next. All right, this is, I'm going to spend a moment on this one. In 1958, the Vice President uh, took a tour of, uh, of South America. And um, uh, it was, uh, had some very um, uh, anti American demonstrations took place. This one took place in Caracas, Venezuela in 1958. Um, this one was really serious. Uh, so serious uh, that, in fact, I think that there's an, enough information that if then Vice President Nixon probably wouldn't have made the decision at the last minute, they might, no one would have made it out. And I'll just tell you, uh, they landed at the airport. There was supposed to be a, a motorcade that goes down. Um, they didn't have very many agents with them at that time. Uh, and the crowd was getting very close to the car, smashing the car. And they were trying to literally turn the car over. Because one of the ways you can do it, if you rock a car enough, you can turn it over, you can like the gas tank, and, and up it goes. And uh, so the, the, um, uh, the agents, of course, were trying very hard and in, in, in the best gentle sort of way to move it aside. So these are some of the pictures 
Um, this is the beginning. This is the presidential car right down here. Um, Emory Roberts is right there. He's coming, he's coming, he's right there, he's coming up. And then this is where he basically put himself in arm's way. This is the president, I'm sorry, the vice presidential car. Uh, vice President Nixon was in the back and he literally put himself on the bumper over the back window so that no projectiles or anything could get through the back window, at least first not going through him. And um, this is uh, what the car looked like at the end. These are two other agents, and all three agents um, uh, received a, a medal of valor for their efforts. And I have it. So there. This, uh, <laughs> uh, but it was a, a, a yeah, it's okay. Um, the seriousness of the thing is that as they were going down the boulevard, the vice president made a decision not to go, and I believe it was Simon Boulevard, they were going to lay a wreath. And he made the decision to go directly to the embassy. And later it was discovered that there were two, and this is again by press account, not by two to three hundred Molotov cocktails waiting for them at the wreath signing, and they were pretty sure they couldn't stop them. And of course, heaving that number, uh, the car probably would have been cooked. And, um, and everything else. So it was, it was really, it was quite, there's a lot more stories to Caracas, but we have a lot of ground I'm uncovered next. Um, this one I'm sort of proud of. Here is um, President Kennedy and John Glenn uh, coming out of Mercury Control and uh, uh, Emory Roberts was right in the middle. It was just caught and this picture hangs in our, uh, hangs, hangs in our house and I'm just, it's just one of the things I'm really proud of. Next. This is just a picture in, in the uh, West Wing. Uh, I believe that that's Ambassador Gavin that he's talking to, and the gentleman that my f father is, is on the left is talking to, I believe is the naval, naval aide to the president. Next. Uh, this is just a very good picture. It's one of my favorite pictures. I wish I knew exactly where it was. I do not. Uh, but it is um, uh, uh, my, uh, dad following uh, the president, Mrs. Kennedy. Um, I would like to just stop at this moment, and I will tell very few stories. My, my brother has most of them, but I have a couple that I would like to tell. We think this is very, very close to towards uh, just after what was called the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis occurred in October of uh, 1962. You're well aware of it, there was a blockade. Uh, history now tells us we were much, much closer to a nuclear exchange than we ever believed. Uh, that in fact they had nuclear missiles ready to go in Cuba, but that's, that's later history. Um, my father, in my eyes, was um, one of these individuals who was a tough guy. Sorry to put it that way. And he was coming home from the White House each day looking very concerned. And he would be bringing home water and sterno and putting it in the basement. Again, not saying anything, just bringing it home. Now, I, I have a comment to make to anyone who is a parent. If you want your children to listen to you, don't yell, whisper. In the middle of the night, I was in bed. I had to get up to use the restroom. We lived in a very small house. And my mother and my father, very uncharacteristically, are at the dining room table and my father is telling my mother, and I listened, okay, very carefully, if something happens, now I even knew what that meant. This is the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is Washington, D.C., by the way. Where do you think they're coming into, okay? Um, if something happens, I'm not coming home. I'll be with the president. That's a big story. First, he's telling his wife with two children, good luck, okay? That's, second of all, there is no question that if my father had to choose between even his family and his job, his job came first. That was a different, I'm not arguing plus or minus, I'm just saying that's just the way it was. And of course nothing did happen, uh, but it's something you do not forget no matter what age you become. Um, that moment of listening to your father tell your mother, if something happens, you're on your own. Um, there'd been nothing to come back to, but that's... Um, all right, next. There, um, the, all the presidents send out Christmas cards. We have a number of them. Even my son has some because, and I just showed three here. These are three that the Ken two of the Kennedys used, one the Kennedys did not use because, of course, of the assassination. 
There's the red room, the green room, and the blue room. The blue room was never sent because of the assassination. But the, the red uh, room, uh, just to give you an idea of what these cards actually look like, I brought it. This is the actual card. This is the size. All right. So when I had the picture, this is what this is the size of the Christmas cards that were sent out, and um, it says with appreciation and best wishes for Happy Christmas 1962, and it's John Kennedy and Jack and Jacqueline Kennedy. And so, but we have a number of these. But I'm just saying that I just wanted to let you know what the size uh, looked like, so you have some feeling of this. And uh, and it's a nice collection, and we're really. I mean, this is almost 50 years old now. I mean, it's a uh, next. By sheer chance, my wife was looking behind one of the cards. This is what the back looks like. See, I told you, this is what the back looks like. All right? And one of them had a Christmas tag on it. Right there. We just never paid much attention to it. So we blew it up. What does it say? It is in Jackie Kennedy's handwriting, Mr. Roberts, with appreciation from us both, Jacqueline Kennedy. Okay, it's handwritten. So we haven't taken it off because it's been there for so long and it's on scotch tape that we just thought we'd just leave it. It's exactly that way. Uh, so it gives you an idea. Next. Uh, this is uh, leaving Air Force One um, and uh, uh, it's leading up to that fateful day. Next. This is the beginning of the fateful day in Dallas. Uh, this is the cover of a magazine that obviously was done after the assassination, but this is at Love Field in Dallas on the day of the assassination. Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy, of course, and uh, my father is uh, caught right in the middle. You see where the arrow is. Next. This literally, we took off TV. There's a number of TV shows that have come out since. This was called The Assassination, and here, uh, again, um, Emory Roberts is on the right with the arrow, and obviously President Kennedy, and again, we just took it right off. Um, right off the TV. Next. Now this is this is a little bit of fun, so I hope you don't mind. We have a little fun uh, in the movie in the line of fire. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. Doesn't really matter. With Clint Eastwood, he plays a Secret Service agent that supposedly was at the assassination of President Kennedy, and then there's another assassination that's taking place in the movie. All right. Now I just want to show you. There's Clint Eastwood. There is Emmy Roberts. Okay, this came right out of the movie. Now, what did the movie do? They took this picture, this actual picture, and put Clint Eastwood in and took out Agent Jack Reedy right there. Okay, it's exactly the same photo. They just took the the they digitized one out, put another one in. So this is exact. But nonetheless, you have to understand. I did not know, I mean, I went to the movie because I saw what it was about, because of obviously my father's interest. There I am sitting in the movie, and, and Dad pops up. <laughs> what can I say? You know, it was like, oh, hi, Dad. That was, uh, so, but I just thought that, uh, so you could see, this is, this is the motorcade, unfortunately, on the day of the assassination, and that's exactly where my father was, and, uh, uh, and Emmy Roberts was the shift leader, meaning, the, the presidential detail had a head of the entire operation. And then, obviously, you have to protect the president 24, uh, 24 hours. So there were three shifts, eight hours. His shift was on duty at the time. So he was the shift leader at the time. Next. Now, this is interesting because this is a picture of the, uh, uh, the funeral procession. Obviously, the casket, I think you can pick out Senator Kennedy right there. The reason I put this arrow is that Steve and I physically were right there. We were in the White House. We were right to the left of the White House in terms of it, and we saw the entire procession. I mean, Charles de Gaulle is a big fellow. Hamish Selassie does wear a lot of medals, um, and obviously the solemn event, the Kennedys and stuff. And I'll never forget um, going home and looking out the rearview mirror of our car when we were being driven home, and Air Force One dipped over the grave. So. Next. This is a note that, um, this is the card that was handed out as part of the, um, 
uh, the funeral, obviously President Kennedy with a, you know, some kind of religious comments on the back. And this was a note that was included, and it says, for Emory Roberts, thank you for all you did for the president, and please don't forget him, Jacqueline Kennedy, and we have framed that. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to stop at this point and see if we can get, get a DVD running. This is in the line of fire. There it is. I mean, that is in the line of fire, Clint Eastwood. It's in that photo. This is taken off of, of a show called The Assassination, not 24 hours, it's just called The Assassination. And there's a real good picture of, of Emory Roberts, so we just included it. This next one is a movie called The Assassination, 24 hours after. I ran up to the presidential car. Mrs. Kennedy was leaning over the president. I asked her to get up, but she would not. I lifted her arm and saw the president's head, and I knew he was dead. As soon as I saw the president's head, I said to Agent Roy Kellerman, you stay with Kennedy, I'm going to Johnson. Johnson is literally in the dark. He's rushed into the hospital. They turn left, they turn right, they move straight. It's it's just turns. Randy in Roberts. In a no relation. Johnson just one of those lectures now. Isolated with Lady Bird and a few other people in that room. He doesn't know there's an assassination. The president's dead by this time. Nobody tells him the president's dead. And then Johnson wants to know what's happening. He's asking for information. The person who gives him his first report is Emory Roberts, who was in the presidential detail. Emory Roberts has seen the president. He has already made up his mind that the president is dead, and he believes that his responsibility now is to protect Lyndon Johnson. But he gives him a very pessimistic report on Kennedy's condition, that he suffered a <coughs> wound, and that he has seen the wound, and he does not believe that Kennedy can survive. But he stopped short of telling the truth, which is that Kennedy's dead. So from the minute they arrive in Parkland Hospital, Emory Roberts and Rufus Youngblood, they're in Lyndon Johnson's space. They want him on a plane, they want him in the air, and they want to get him to D.C. as fast as possible. Is this a coup? Is this a prelude to a nuclear attack? Mr. Vice President, you have to get back to the White House. you got to get out of here. We can't protect you here. We don't know what's going on. Lyndon Johnson says no. I will not leave until I find out about the president's condition. Based on the eyewitness testimony, I believe Lyndon Johnson heard that President Kennedy was dead at 1.10 p.m. Central Standard Time, and he learned from Secret Service agent Emory Roberts. When he found out the president was dead, he was ready to leave the hospital, but he wasn't going to leave just based on Emory Roberts' work. Emory Roberts had no standing. He wanted to get it formally and officially from Kenny O'Donnell. With Johnson, politics is always involved. He knows instinctively that every action he takes will be judged back in Washington by the Attorney General. And Robert Kennedy is looking over his shoulder and will try to spin every decision he makes in the worst possible light. So by having Kenny O'Donnell sanction every decision. Johnson is essentially transferring responsibility. So by the time Kenny O'Donnell actually did come into the room at 115 and told him that Kennedy was dead, Johnson already knew, but he pretended not to know. This is the day following the next day. And I believe that is it. All right, now we could go on to the next president. Uh, I cannot, I know we're running out of time, but I have to, leave, I have to tell one quick story. Um, the issue was, where was I on the day of the assassination? And I was in 11th grade. I was old enough to know what was going on. Um, the, we did not have cell phones and all of that things at that time, so therefore the, the school, to their credit, knew that once they announced that the president had been assassinated, um, they um, would have pandemonium. 
and an awful lot of people came to school on buses. And I'm, I'm, I know that you're in 11th grade, you're supposed to assume that adults don't know what they're doing, um, but they clearly did. They held the message, they got the buses to come to the high school, and they announced over the intercom that the president had been assassinated, that Governor Conway had been wounded, and then a Secret Service agent had been killed. And so I, I, I was out of the room in a minute, a minute, second. Um, I was thinner then, I could move quicker. Um, and I got to the phone and whatever it was, a nickel a quarter, I don't know what it was. Anyway, I called, I called mother and I said, is dad okay? She did not hesitate one item and she said, he's fine. And the pandemonium was breaking loose. And so I said, I'll see you tonight. And so that was that. We didn't, you know, I didn't say to her, did you hear the news? It was that simple, is dad okay? Three days later, this is the reason I didn't go into journalism. It took me three days to get a second question. Um, I, asked, I asked my mother, how did you know he was okay? And she said, I didn't. And I said, well, suppose he wasn't okay. And she says to me, we would have dealt with it at that time. I thought, lady, you're over my head. Um, okay, moving on. This is now the next president, Lyndon Johnson. My, uh, uh, Emory Roberts was assigned as a receptionist, which means he met people coming to see the president both on and off the record. Next. And also did a little traveling with the president. Here he is with the, uh, the president and, uh, from Mexico. Uh, next. Now, this is something I just want to do very quickly. Presidents of the United States have what's called a franking privilege, meaning that they sign their name where the stamp is. So here I have it an envelope addressed to my father, signed by LBJ. It's a really nice note that says, thanks for being such a good friend. And they were good friends. After, after the Johnson left the White House, my father would go and visit. Um, and anyway, this is just, it's a very interesting one. Now, of course, I happen to, if you want to see, I happen to have it, okay? But that's not the story. This is obviously some sort of machine, okay? The, the LBJ, next. That is one from Harry Truman. If anybody has any history at all of Harry Truman, he did everything longhand. And I have that one. And that's his signature. And he signed the envelope addressed to my dad for the stamp to be sent through the mail. I mean, it's just sort of little memorabilia to have, which is really something. So next. Uh, this is uh, in DMI, again, just showing you with Johnson. One more. All right, this is a um, very interesting picture because you have to recognize some people in this. Uh, there's Dan Rather. They're coming out of the press room. There's Helen Thomas. Okay, and, I, and it's important to point her out. I just want to point her out. There's Helen Thomas. There's Emory Roberts. And that's literally his desk. That's what he was receptionist. That's where he worked in the West Wing of the White House, right in front of the press. And so, anyway, so we'll come back to Alan Thomas a little bit later. Next. All right, this is a uh, Oval Office scene. Uh, there's President Johnson, lots of press, so we just call it Roberts attending the, uh, to the press, whether he did or not in any event, and Emily Roberts is back there. And now I'm about to uh, change speakers because our next photo is 40 years later. And Emory Roberts' grandson is now in the room. There is President Bush, and there is John Roberts. And now he will come up and talk about his time in the White House. My son, John Roberts. I'll try to make this quick. And uh, Gleaves did the, uh, the intro or the bio, so you have a little bit of the background. I'll jump into it. I just want to say thanks, everybody, for having me here. Um, I promised Gleaves I'd start, I'd talk about how my start for everyone in the room, and it, it did start with an internship. So I will say that uh, I was actually at an uh, intern at the U.S. Embassy in London when uh, the president, when President Bush was coming over to meet with Tony Blair, and uh, everything kind of spiraled through there. I was able to get into that trip and, and help out, and uh, through an internship, got a job. And uh, the next job after that was in the West Wing, working in the press office, um, kind of went through there. So I'm going to try to... Um, talk about a few of the pictures we've picked just for interest and tell a few stories. 
One thing I will say is that in the first uh, 18 months of the White House, I was in over 29 countries, um, some in advance of the president, some with the president at the time. Um, security is much different for both the president and uh, the vice president now. Uh, four people. I think. I think the vice president shift in itself is 12 people, and uh, even the vice president I don't think goes anywhere without 80 uh, Secret Service. Uh, we. Uh, my first international trip with the president was in Africa. We were driving down the road before the president got there, and six cars passed us, uh, all SUVs, and they all had Maryland license plates. Uh, and then you uh, look up, and uh, four helicopters fly by, and they all say the United States of America on them. So. Security now, and at all, um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit more about the security angle, although I was not a Secret Service agent by any means. Um, but uh, security is much tighter, and a lot of it actually goes back to uh, the, the day in Dallas. The, the press now travel with the president anywhere in the world he goes, which is why working in the press office has got to be one of the best jobs, because uh, they need the press office to go with you, or with him. Uh, so Camp David, uh, if the president has a ranch in, uh, in Texas, he spent a lot of time down there, or if it was Clinton and a lot of time up, up in the Northeast, the press office would go up there. So I'm going to flip through these pretty quickly so we can get to some good stories from my uncle, but I'm also going to try to tell from a security angle. Uh, quickly, in the Oval Office with the press, this would happen on a regular basis. This happens to be with a foreign leader, so there's more press, but more than three or four times a week. Um, so there's two or three Secret Service agents in the room, uh, something like this. Uh, next picture, please. Uh, you can see how crowded it is. Uh, those people, you can't see the president's chair was right here. They are arm's length to the president. And it, you know, while you look at the pictures of the Oval, and it looks like a very big room. Uh, those people can actually reach out and touch the president if they're on the sides. Uh, they can't from the front. There's a boom mic with a little bit of distance. So it's, it's pretty tight in there when you get all the press in. But we could get 30 press in there at some time. I'll actually show you a picture with a little bit more. So uh, next. Uh, this is the uh, West Wing uh, press office, and I'll, uh, I only included this because it's very tight space. We're actually getting ready to move out of this, and they were going to redo it. But this area back here where you can see this uh, picture, that actually was where Richard Nixon kept his dogs, and actually where my desk was, was with the changing area for the pool. So, uh, so as, 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 the, as the government grows, so does the office space needed. And uh, so it was actually a pretty tight working space in the West Wing, and that is actually connected to the press briefing room. So where you see the press secretary give, um, giving the, or addressing the press every day, this is what's behind it. Now it's much cleaner now because it was renovated during the uh, Bush administration, but this was the, the old look. Next, please. Uh, and here's a better, we're getting ready to move out for the renovation. So here's how tight it was. You'd have three people down there, uh, and, and you wouldn't have the boxes, but a pretty tight space there in the West Wing. Next, please. Uh, this is the colonnade, and one of the reasons I included this photo is I'm actually standing in the, the president's ready, getting ready to come out and give a give remarks to the press in the Rose Garden. And so we didn't see a Rose Garden photo of, uh, of my grandfather, but there are plenty of press events. And so this was just setting it up, and, and uh, they're getting ready to test the lights and that type of thing. Next. Um, although my uncle thinks that I photoshopped this picture, this is real. Um, I can't explain why my tie is blowing up, and, and but uh, we, it really is. Uh, so every, every time Marine One would come and go, uh, if I wasn't on travel duty with the president that day, you'd be responsible for getting the press in and out. Um, so again, the, the great things that you guys would see on TV, the, the setting up for take 20 or 30 minutes, uh, sometimes before or after, and this is just one of those times. Working in the press office, I uh, had a lot of photographers around, so I got a lot of great candidates photos a lot more than most people in the White House, mainly because I could get them from not just the official photographer, but also from the members of the press themselves. Next, please. Um, this was a regular occurrence on Air Force One where the president would come back and uh, critique whatever whatever was being reported, if it was his speech or if it was uh, some other uh, world event. And so this is just a great photo where uh, he's back here watching himself on TV. Um, and those of you that can't see it, because it was asked, yes, Fox News was standard. Um, and, and CNN, could I get any of the channels, but it is up there. And uh, members of the press corps would ask uh, also. So this was a, kind of the staff area that he would come back if he was uh, um, you know, getting ready to, to talk to the press or whatever. He'd come back and get a briefing. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, just another candid photo on the, on the plane, and uh, he came back and was asking about something that somebody had said, and so we were looking into it for him. And, um, and his, so quickly, if you went to the right, that would be the front of the plane, and then the left would be the back. The back is where the Secret Service and the press would sit. And then um, that wall behind us is a cabinet room, and then, uh, I'm sorry, a conference room. And then uh, he's actually, his, the, the first family's quarters are all the way up in front. Next, please. 
This is, um, I'm not sure how many of you uh, remember it uh, because I was there, I laughed pretty hard and remember it, but this was uh, when the president had announced uh, John Roberts as a chief justice, not as a, um, he was first announced as a, as a justice in the Rose Garden and then uh, the chief justice passed away as they announced him as a chief justice, they actually did that in the state dining room. And um, I was going to include a picture of, of, the, of the Chief Justice son actually dancing around, but I kind of felt bad, so I just have me standing in. But it was the night where, while the President's addressing the nation and talking about how important the Supreme Court is, the, the uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, uh, youngest son, who I think is four, was kind of done with being on parade for a week. He had gone up to Capitol Hill, he had done everything, and he, and he was done. He started dancing around. And so uh, NBC had three cameras, and they, they didn't actually show it until uh, afterwards. They were pretty good, but they kept having to change cameras because he was literally dancing. At one point, did a cartwheel. Um, and so uh, and he, he was done uh, behaving. And so uh, the, the Chief Justice family all stood here, and then once she, um, uh, the Chief Justice's wife actually got her hand back on her son, they actually left halfway through because uh, I was a little out of control. So I, it was one of the more funny moments because the president's still trying to address the nation live, looking forward, and the cartwheel's happening. And, and people are, I mean, the cameraman's laughing. And, you know, so anyways, uh, ne this next photo here, um, we wanted to point this out because Helen Thomas is still there. Uh, I've been talking to Helen on a daily basis when I was in the press office. She uh, doesn't believe in uh, email, and so we would send out the, uh, the email, the, press, the president's press schedule every day and uh, her protest, and I asked her if it was an official protest and she wouldn't answer. She would call me every morning, or she'd call a line, but I'd be there every morning. I would read her the press schedule, she'd say thanks, and she'd hang up and she'd come in, but did it every day. Um, so there she is, uh, still at work, and this is before we remodeled the press office. Uh, the briefing room, next please. Um, again, traveling with the president, this is the president taping his radio address that would happen on Saturday mornings, uh, taping it on a Friday, this is a regular occurrence, and you can see that there's a video camera in the room, um, and uh, th that's White House TV, it's official, so we were talking about uh, archives at, at our table, but that's something that would go into the archives so they have video of it. Um, I hate to admit that I worked in the press office and wasn't smart enough to say put it on YouTube as President Obama is doing so good for him, but uh, so now it's on that, that you can actually watch the radio address for those that are in interested, but I uh, uh, recorded every every Friday, so we're someplace in Asia, and I actually don't know where we taped at that time, but uh, taped there and then would be would be sent back and played. Next, please. Uh, this was uh, probably the, the most full uh, press event in the in the Oval Office, and this was following Katrina uh, and the Katrina Fund that the President set up, and uh, you know, great little story here about uh, uh, President Bush, uh, 43, or for ease here, his father, 40, uh, 41, and President Clinton, 42, all coming together on a uh, a very important issue, and uh, the press will tell you that President Clinton was always the most friendly with the press and loved to talk and would, would spend a lot of time uh, hanging out. And I've met him numerous times, and I think he is uh, very personable and uh, very nice in person. Um, enjoy talking with him. President Bush, uh, uh, the incumbent president, you know, talks about how serious it is and thanks everybody and is getting ready to walk to his uh, conference room or walk out. And President Clinton's got this look like he really wants to talk to the press, like he really wants to go up to the podium and, and the event's kind of over. And, he's, and so he looks over at uh, President Bush 41 and is looking at him and, and, and uh, President Bush 41 actually says out loud, I don't think we're supposed to talk. And they both, <laughs> and they both walk out. And it was, I mean, the press laughed and everybody in the room, but you could tell they just really wanted to get to the podium. So, uh, so it was pretty good, but uh, great picture there. Uh, next, please. Uh, so. In closing, I kind of want to go back again to the to the thing that I promised I would talk about and really do believe in, and that is whatever it is, if you're a grad student, if you're uh, an undergrad, you're not sure what you want to do, or you, you definitely know what you want to do, uh, getting an internship, and even if you're wrong, but investing that time, I will say that I'm now a manager of uh, you know 12 uh, staff, and, and half of them have a secondary degree. Um, I posted a starting position with uh, 50 applicants I got, uh, people with 10 or 15 years experience, and, and uh, I didn't run the process myself until the final, and two of the people who got through were people who had interned in the office mainly because they knew it. Um, and it was the same thing that when, when I was interviewing for my first job coming off of the internship, I had spent five or six months learning the process and, and, and doing everything I could, working late, going in early, and, uh, and asking lots of questions. And, uh, and, and that really, to me, is something that has paid off. And I would say I advise my interns when they, when they stay in the program, if they don't want to work in, in our office when they leave, what else are they looking at? Um, and the other thing I just want to touch on is that when you're making, when, when you are interning, uh, you know, definitely read, 
read up, spend the time, but don't be afraid to make decisions. I mean, one of the things that uh, if you don't know, you shouldn't make a decision, but if you, if you think you have an idea, don't be afraid to speak up, don't be afraid to try something. Um, I push our, our interns, I've doubled the number in the office to six, which is uh, big for us, they're very helpful, but push them because they, they, they have a different experience. So all of you that aren't sure, I would say, whatever time you're investing studying or on the weekends or extra projects, if you can get an internship for eight, 10, 12 hours, uh, I, I would definitely take it, and I would. Yeah, I know Lance seems a bit of a hype, but if you need any help looking at places and any number of things, please, Gleaves has my contact info. Uh, both sides of the aisle, not political, not even policy related, uh, engineering, and we'll find something. But uh, I would definitely recommend it, especially in this environment. So I'll be around for questions after. But uh, the best part's yet to come, so I definitely want to get out of the way. Um, go ahead and introduce my uncle Steve, who's got uh, who's got all the best stories. So thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, having us. To me, this is a really special treat because uh, the first time anyone asked me to speak on anything, so <laughs> I'm just delighted to be here. Probably the last time anyone asked me, but, but I am really excited to be here. Uh, like my brother was saying, our father didn't talk at the dining room table about all his experiences. It was his job, and um, that's the way it was. That's the way he supported his family. After he retired, uh, Doug had already left the house, married, and moved on. I was in college. And uh, we bought a new house and helping in the yard. And I, and uh, during that summer, he started reminiscing and telling me stories that I never heard before. So, and so it was a wonderful experience. Um, starting at the beginning, Roosevelt, I asked uh, uh, my father, what was his first job as a Secret Service agent? He says, the Ro uh, President Roosevelt's grandchild. I said, well, what did you do with the grandchild? He says, well, basically, I was a glorified babysitter. But I took them to the um, National Zoo almost every day. And I got to the point that I could tell when they got a new monkey in the monkey cage. <laughs> so the, it's not all exciting. It's babysitting the grandchildren sometimes. Uh, moving on to Truman, um, uh, I asked uh, my father, did anyone ever try to bribe him at any time? He says, yes, during Truman. I said, well, what was it about? He says, well, uh, there was a, someone wanted to meet the president. Just shake his hand, that was it. He says, well, what did he offer you? He says, a brand new car. He says, well, how was it going to work? He says, well, uh, I, he would just stand on, uh, he'd be standing in a railroad car, and when the president comes through, I would just stop, introduce the president, they would shake hands and walk away, and I would get a new car. And I said, what happened? He says, we don't have a new car, do we? So anyway, the, uh, that's the end of that one. Um, uh, Margaret Truman. Margaret Truman was the daughter of President Truman. Uh, she was a very good pianist and would make uh, concert tours around the uh, country. And uh, uh, Dad was the only agent assigned to uh, uh, Margaret Truman. And he uh, related, sometimes you have to make decisions. So the same idea of John, you just make decisions. Um, uh, sometimes she would be on stage and there would be like six entrances to the stage where she's playing on the piano. He was the only agent. He would call in other agents. I believe it was Cleveland that it was in, called in Secret Service agent from Detroit and that sort of thing. He says, I only had five agents and six doors to protect. He says, someone has to make a decision on which door you're not protecting. He says, you make it and you go on. Um, moving on to Eisenhower. Eisenhower, uh, that was at the height of the Cold War. Um, and very concerned about security, about bugs in the White House. They, they found some bugs in embassy over in uh, Moscow. And so if the President Eisenhower wanted a really top secret conversation, he would go play golf. Uh, they would tee off on the first hole and just walk 18 holes in the golf course having a conversation. And the conversations were so tightly held that even the Secret Service agents weren't there. Uh, one would be on either side and one ahead. And on the golf course they would carry, uh, this is 1950, uh, a Tommy gun in a golf bag, just like uh, the old, old movies. Um, and on one of these trips, uh, uh, our father was on the side, and he saw a rifle pointed at the president. Well, what do you do? Well, he investigated, and turned out it was a couple kids, about 11 years old. They were target practicing uh, with the 22 rifle with a scope on it. Heard the president was playing golf, snuck into the golf course, and they're looking at the president through the scope to get a better look at him. So you can imagine if you guess wrong, Secret Service agents kills two 10-year-olds, you know, whatever. So, um, moving on, uh, Vice President Nixon, Mrs. Nixon. Again, this is in the 50s. Um, um, 
Uh, things were, uh, my brother Doug mentioned, things were drastic, uh, different 60 years ago. In fact, uh, he was with uh, Vice President Nixon and Mrs. Nixon in 53 when I was born. Uh, he was on the trip. Uh, only four agents again, uh, and spend, you know, 12, 18, uh, Dad would say sometimes 20, 24 hours. And he would be the only agent with, with both of them. Um, but the, the agents really did like uh, Mrs. Nixon. Because uh, one of the stories related to me was uh, he was out shopping with Mrs. Nixon, and Mrs. Nixon said, have you got something for your wife? You can't go around the world and not bring something back. And he says, no. And Corey says, well, come on, let's go shopping. Corey, he's professional. No, no, I can't do any shopping. I mean, his job is to protect her and be with her. He says, no, okay, that, we can't have that. So Mrs. Nixon helped pick out some stuff for my mother to keep him out of the doghouse when he came back from the trip. So, but it's little things like that that really endears the Secret Service agents that they're, they're human too. Um, moving on, uh, Mrs. Kennedy. Um, uh, Emery Roberts was the very first uh, Secret Service agent assigned to Mrs. Kennedy. And he was assigned to the First Lady Elect. So in November of 60, 1960, um, he was signed to whoever won the election. Uh, again, that was uh, Nixon and uh, Kennedy were running in the 1960 presidential election. National Airport, Washington, D.C., with a ticket up to Massachusetts if Kennedy won and a ticket out to California if Nixon won. Uh, you probably don't remember, but it was a very close election. And the, uh, it wasn't announced who won the election until the next morning. So he says all night long, you know, he's waiting for, you know, announcement of who won the election. Um, a flight would come up, you would turn in that ticket, get the next ticket to California, then the flight to Massachusetts would come up, you turn in the ticket and get the next ticket. And he did that all day long and through the night, and he ended up spending the night at National Airport. It was announced the next morning, President Kennedy, Kennedy won, so he flew up to Massachusetts, walked up to Mrs. Kennedy, says, Mrs. Kennedy, I'm Secret Service Agent Emery Roberts, and I'll be with you. He says, but it wasn't a good first, uh, first meeting, because he says, I've been sleeping in the airport all night, long and I hadn't been able to shave so when I arrived I was looking really scuffy and it wasn't a really good first impression so uh, he was the first one then all the other agents arrived during the day uh, talking about with Mrs. Uh, Kennedy uh, he mentioned that uh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy would uh, Car Caroline, Caroline uh, play on the rocks in Iannisport uh, rocks ocean and the waves would be coming in and he says it really scared him because I mean it, a little girl just slipped into the ocean there's nothing he could do about it but he wasn't in charge because Mrs. Kennedy, the mom, made those decisions. But he says he was so nervous watching the kids play on the rocks or around the breakers. And anyway, you do what you can. Um, he was only with Mrs. Kennedy a very short time. And that is because of his horse riding, or I should say jumping ability. Mrs. Kennedy was an avid horse lady. She uh, rode exceptionally well and also known for her jumping ability. Our father grew up on a farm, and he, a farm, on a farm, and rode very well and jumped, but he could not jump as well as Mrs. Kennedy. So on the normal jumps, he could stay up with her, but on the high jumps, and couldn't. And the Secret Service agent has to stay with who you're protecting. I don't care if it's running or swimming or whatever. Uh, so anyway, on the high jumps, he had to run around. And anyway, so uh, uh, he got uh, moved to uh, presidential to the uh, president's um, detail, President Kennedy. So left the first lady and moved to the President Kennedy. Uh, oh, did you know that the president's bedroom door is never locked? You wanted to say, wow, Steve, how do you know that? Come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> the way I know it is, uh, my dad re relayed the story to me. This is in Camp David. He's outside the president's door at 2 a.m. Every hour, the Secret Service agents uh, move shifts, and he heard help, help, help over the walkie-talkie. Now, there's big bricks back then in the 1960s, and uh, that's it. So I said, Dad, what did you do? He says, well, I grabbed the shotgun, turned the knob on the president's bedroom door, pushed in with my foot, went into the bedroom with my shotgun, looked around, and everything's fine. Mrs. Kennedy and the President Kennedy and another couple were playing cards. I said, Dad, what did you do? He says, well, I stuck the shotgun behind my back, backed out of the room, and said, excuse me, Mr. President, and closed the door. I said, Dad, don't you think the President had a lot of questions? He goes, yeah, but I didn't have any answers. <laughs> so... Uh, Uh, there is a, a downside about having your dad being in the Secret Service. They do travel a lot and, and they're gone a lot. I can remember one year 
he was gone for over 250 days, uh, which is uh, quite a bit. Um, also, personally, I didn't like President Kennedy, not about his policies or whatever, but every weekend he went up to Hyannisport. And of course, I was in school, fifth grade, and I was off weekends, and every weekend my dad was up in Massachusetts, and I knew the president was taking my dad away, and I wanted dad time. So anyway, I really didn't like the president, but that's personal. I've gotten over it, by the way, now. <laughs> The, uh, let's see, oh, uh, presidential travel is always secret uh, until it's officially announced. And the presidents take uh, trips on very short notice and on numerous occasions, uh, the, my father would call up my mother and say, hey, can you pack me a suitcase? And they had code, pack warm or pack cold, cold. So uh, it would, she would pack a suitcase for him and then would drive it down to the White House so it would have some clothes to wherever they uh, tri uh, went to. But made many trips with uh, my mother to the White House dropping off uh, suitcases at the last moment. Uh, moving on to Johnson. Um, uh, this story is not from my dad. It happens from, to be from another Secret Service agent. Uh, the story is uh, there's the President Johnson, my father, and the, another Secret Service agent. For some reason, uh, President Johnson wanted to get into a locked room in, in the West Wing. Uh, being the receptionist, he had all the keys to all the rooms. And so he's hunkled down trying to figure out which key on the big key ring opens it up. And President Johnson went up and started pushing him on the back going, come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up. And the story told by the other agent that was there, because there's only three, he says, my dad stood up, turned around, looked the president in the eye and said, no one, I mean no one touches me. And the other agent said either he just lost his job or he won the president's respect. Well, luckily it turned out to be the second because he, he was still there. And uh, if you think about it, uh, uh, who better to have protecting you that someone's not afraid of anybody, including the president. So. Um, okay, uh, talk about dating. Uh, as a teenager, I asked my dad, I says, what's it like to date, you know, as the president's daughter or whatever? And he says, well, it's not a whole lot different from uh, normal dating, except you have a Secret Service agent with you at all times. And uh, at the time, being a teenager, um, uh, I asked him about, well, what about parking? Well, parking is an old term where if you wanted to kiss a little bit, you <laughs> drive the car someplace, you know, secluded, park and make out for a while, that term parking. He says, what about parking? He says, oh, what they do is they get in the back, they would tell me to keep driving around the block and don't look back. So he says, after about three times around the block, they were totally engrossed in the back seat. He says, they really didn't wear, care where you drove. So he says, basically, after about three times around the block, he got tired and he would just drive around Washington, D.C., wherever he wanted to. And when they were done, they would say, okay, well, you know, it's time to uh, end the date and, and go back. So if you're wondering what it's like, you always have Secret Service protection, but they find a way around it. Um, with that, um, at, at the end, um, uh, this uh, uh, conversation, uh, my dad said that he could write a book guaranteed to be a bestseller. I said, Dad, what could you possibly write about that other people would want to read? All he told me was, presidents are human too. <laughs> so with that, uh, that concludes our presentation. Um, and I really uh, will open up for questions or turn it over. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions you have? Yes. I have a question about Bush 41. I heard the other day on the news that he was having breakfast someplace down in Texas and somebody started um, verbalizing about how many people he killed and so forth. Um, I would assume they have protection. Why? How could that happen? Uh, yes, they do have, I didn't actually hear the story, they do have protection for life uh, depending on the threat and especially President Bush 41, there's an outstanding threat from, uh, at the time it was President Hussein uh, of, of Iraq, but definitely his followers still nationally have a, or internationally still have a threat on him. Uh, Secret Service would probably be there, but it would just be, it would be like any other event with the current president or former president that they don't deal with free speech, they don't right. deal with, I mean, they deal with a threat to him, so that if, you know, if the president were in the room now and you wanted to disagree or yell, that's not a threat 
to okay. to the president. Now, if, you know, if, if you had said I'm coming after you or I'm going to get you, that's different. But um, rallies or events, the Secret Service actually, uh, through the past 15 years, have, have been sued numerous times from groups about overstepping and, and kind of laying out, you know, what it is they're there to do and there to stop. So they're very defensive. They're there, but they're not defensive of, uh, they, they wouldn't go after just for saying we disagree with you. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. What are your family's observations about the leadership uh, that, that your dad saw from a variety of styles of presidency? And also, uh, you guys have been leaders in your own right. So, you know, please uh, address um, that. I, I, I'll, I'll start. I, I did ask uh, our father who he thought the best president was. And he says that's a political decision, in other words. But he says uh, different presidents do run the job differently. He says uh, Johnson uh, was looking for consensus. He would take a lot of input from everybody and try to make a decision. Um, he said, to like uh, on uh, Nixon, uh, you could always tell that he was in charge in the room. Mm -hmm. So any meeting, you never had to guess who was running the meeting. Uh, so it's just personalities. Uh, presidents uh, just run meetings differently and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, I don't have any comments in terms of the presidents, in terms of my own uh, background. Uh, I have been very fortunate. Uh, I have worked uh, directly for four governors, not four presidents, who also had different styles. And I will tell you uh, the one issue that I think distinguishes uh, some leaders from others is they often go into the room and they often know more than anybody else in the room. And there is no substitute for individual hard work, doing your background yourself if you're the leader, and then using people to, uh, to supplement what you already know. Um, and uh, the second issue is when you think you know what, where you want to go, that's good. Think a lot harder than some people want to about how you're going to get there. So you want, you want to get there, that's fine. You now agreed, you know what policy you want. That's, that's wonderful, that's good. But now you have to step back and say, now how do I get there? What, what do I have to do? Who do I have to influence? What do I have to do to get to where it is what I think uh, we want to go? They're the two principles that I've remembered. It's the one thing I would add to all of that is, is uh, long term versus short term. And, and all leaders, governors, uh, right now I'm working for uh, state legislators. You, you see it at the national level, presidents uh, make decisions that uh, are going to be popular or not it depends and it depends on kind of what the what the mission is and so making decisions based on concrete information is is hard when you have a lot more than the people who are judging you and it's true for any leader making a decision that even if some people don't want to talk about you know if it's budget details here in the state of Michigan or if it's a war or health care at the national level that it, you know educating people on the key points uh, if they're going to be the ones who are going to say in a poll either we like you or we don't and that's how things are going to be determined uh, getting that information out is, is uh, I think very important as to why you make certain decisions and I would uh, use an example and that is that uh, the president I work for on a regular basis would meet with historians on issues, uh, economic historians, uh, uh, international, didn't matter. And I, I worked in the press office and I remember giving a member of the press a hard time saying that Bush was worried about his legacy. And this is in 2005 and that's why he's meeting with historians. And to me, it really frustrated me because you take, um, you know, President Obama has a great economic advisor, uh, well respected I should say, uh, and she was a PhD in, in the history of the Great Depression. And that's what she did. And so to have it on staff is one thing. Well, he, President Bush would bring people in on a regular basis to talk about what were the trends, especially in places like Afghanistan, where you would say, okay, for 200 years, uh, people have been there. What, what have we learned? And, and so the, the fact that the media wanted to report it as someone worried about their legacy, I can't deny that there was a worry or not. I don't know. But the, the reason that they were in the room, we know very well, was the briefing was set up to cover four different issues to get to the end. And if when you're playing, Defense. When you're explaining it in the press, you've missed it because everyone read the first story and was the second. So to you know, really get out there in front on any level, local, uh, state, national, to be out on front and, and be able to explain why you're making the decisions uh, is, is good for any leader. So I would put that out there for presidents or anyone else that, as they make the decisions. When you're making them, get out there as to why and lay that facts out early so that you're defining the, uh, the message. Yeah. I'd just like to add uh, one uh, other thing to that. The most important thing is make a decision. Uh, if, uh, it's, 
and you will be making decisions without all the facts because if you have all the facts, anybody can make the decision. There's no decision to make. Right. Okay? So you have to make decisions without all the facts. You use everything you got, but the most important thing is make a decision, especially starting out. People are afraid of making a mistake. Do I have authority? You know, make a decision and go for it, and that will stand you in much better stead than being wishy-washy. Uh, so anyway, talk about make a decision. Even if it's wrong, it's better than no decision. Yes, sir. I have a sort of a historical question um, because the day that Kennedy was assassinated sticks in my mind vividly. Just like 911, most of us here in this room can remember where you were and everything. I can remember that. And your dad was right there. Your your, your grandfather was right there. Did he ever talk at all about whether he subscribed to the one lone gunman theory versus a multiple participant? Um, the answer is not to me. Um, I will say this. Literally, um, he wrote several reports. I've read several of them that he personally wrote. They quoted one on the um, uh, uh, on the screen we show. Um, when he wrote a report, uh, it was not a flowery report. It was um, right out of Sergeant Friday um, of just the facts, ma'am. And this is I, I'll tell you exactly what he said on the day of the assassination. He didn't know anything about a grassy knoll theory. He didn't say he said all the noise came from behind him. That would be the school book depository. He said there were two or three shots fired. And I even asked him, why didn't you know if it was two or three? And he said, because the brain is not a tape recorder. I thought that was a pretty good answer. Um, he didn't know if it was more than one gun or not. He was very clear that because you can't discern between the, the, the noise between whether it was one weapon, two weapons, but from his point of view, all the noise came from behind him. Um, and that and this was a school book depository. Now, it is conceivable whether or not uh, somebody fired from, say, the, what was called later the Grassy Knoll. The Grassy Knoll was pretty far away. Uh, you could have used the silencer, but again, a little bit in terms of ballistics, the silencer decreases the velocity of a weapon substantially. Decreasing the velocity of the weapon decreases the accuracy of the weapon. Therefore, you wouldn't want to use a silencer any distance away because your accuracy is so, 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 I'm not saying it didn't happen, I'm just saying that's what he reported. When I asked him later about the issue, and I did, he just said, I'm not the investigating officer. And he let it go at that. I mean, he was a very, I, I'm, I'm, I must tell you publicly, I'm a little jealous of, of my brother, simply because I wasn't there. When he was willing to talk, I wasn't around. When I was around, he did very little talking. Uh, my father was very much a loner, and it cost my mother. Because I'm just telling you what happens. You move into a neighborhood. What do people want to know? What do you do for a living? Oh, I protect the president. So they immediately start asking you questions. And his answer was, it's none of your business. Well, that doesn't go real good for friends. OK? <laughs> so the easiest way to solve that problem is you don't have any. You only go out with other Secret Service agents because then you don't have to answer the question. What do you do? Or how come I'm not? How come you're not willing to be friendly? How come you're not willing to help me? How come you're not willing to get my kids into the White House? How come you're not willing to do? You know, if the answer is no, this is this is what I do. Um, so he he. I mean, I admired my father a great deal. He did a terrific job for the uh, for uh, uh, for uh, the government of the United States. But he was not one who would win a lot of elections. Yes. What keeps leading Robertses back to public service? Generation. That is that is a very interesting issue. I, I'm not sure it's much different than maybe a, a, you know a family that uh, 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 stayed in the same business. The business just happens to be public service. Um, I obviously my made my career, or my brother made his career, my son's made a career so far in it. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but I happen to believe, and I'll say it. I think I can speak for all three of us. We believe that it is an honorable profession, and uh, we take pride in doing it. Yes. Uh, please mention in his introduction that you had some insights into public, uh, public education, higher education in Michigan. Would someone like to comment we'll on the graduate you. education future in Michigan? Yeah, uh, sure. I, coming up here to talk about the budget, I'm going to get myself in real trouble. Here. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would just say, and, and one of the, the things, doors. yeah, <laughs> well, one of the things that we that we were discussing, and, and I'll say this is all from a personal standpoint, but we are going to spend the entire legislature and, and the executive branch and everybody in Lansing, the uh, lobbyists, nonprofits, everybody down there will be will be next five months. Uh, 
next six months trying to clear out what they can on the budget for FY11, getting in before the election. So that's, uh, I think everybody knows that. I would, the thing we were talking about is that uh, last year when the state accepted a lot of money from the federal stimulus, there were a lot of strings attached, and one of the strings attached were uh, protection of a lot of programs, including higher ed. So what we were speaking about in terms of the budget is that there are areas, specific programs outside of uh, operating funds for, for higher ed that can be uh, you know that they could go after different programs and I'm not saying they will or won't but operations for higher ed in the state of Michigan are, are definitely going to be protected but one of those programs uh, you know would be the promise grant that you saw um, you, you know a lot of attention at and the reason that you saw the attention there from a lot of people was that it was the rest of higher ed couldn't be touched and so they they went that way not saying right or wrong not defending but just said the, the background on why that got so much attention was that higher ed operations was off the table last year too so um, as an example, I think I think the state legally to stay in line with the uh, with the uh, stimulus. I think we can only cut seven million dollars out of um, out of uh, higher ed operations. And now I, I use the number only. I know that's a lot to people, but the University of Michigan gets three hundred sixty nine by themselves. So if we're cutting seven out of the entire program, and we're missing in our budget almost two billion dollars. Uh, you know, so, I mean, that's a to us, it's not even a drop in the bucket. I mean, there are programs we're looking at that that you know cut more than that. We're that we're debating is it worth it? So, the the picture going forward without tipping the hat, and frankly, uh, with just now starting, the governor's going to give her state of the state and then go on to give uh, her budget, and that's really the the trend in Lansing for a very long time is that the the legislature doesn't respond until the governor uh, gives. Uh, his or her budget. So a lot of debate left, but one of the big things to continue to look at on programs, and, I, and again, this is where I hope as politicians on both sides make decisions that affect all of you, that they are telling you that, you know, hey, we can't cut this program because we agreed to take money, or we, we can do this, or we have to do that, because there are requirements, and, and that's where transparency, and I know it's a buzzword, but really in a conversation, as people say, if they just come out and tell you what, that they've cut something, of missing the background, so couldn't I can't you know no crystal ball in terms of higher ed and where it's going and what what the what a uh, uh, both sides want back in back in Lansing, but there definitely are some restrictions at least for FY eleven. So, any other questions? All right, well then I would like to close with just one very personal story, if you don't mind, and that is. Um, um, I was very fortunate uh, to have uh, an opportunity to visit the White House when my father was there. And as my brother indicated, I also got an opportunity to go and have uh, 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 lunch at the mess at the White House. Uh, but think about this for just a moment as a father. Um, and then I'm talking about myself. I went with my father to the mess at the White House. And then I went with my son to the mess at the White House. That's really cool as a dad. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you so much. What a troika about public service. And I've got to say, uh, on a personal note, there's a fourth public servant in this room, and that's Doug's wife, Bobby. And uh, Bobby and I uh, and Doug all worked together when we were at Lansing. And I think we agreed that it was one of the highlights of our lives to be in Lansing working for a governor at a critical time uh, out of uh, the, the work, in fact, that the three of us, we were on a team of about 11 people, and the three of us were privileged to be on a team that uh, came up with, you know, really making the charter schools possible in this state, Proposal A, having money follow the child, a lot of the things that uh, Brian's dad is, is working with and leveraging for further change. And as Doug Roberts put it so well, uh, we look back on that time as a very special time in our careers. Doug said to me, we had 60 days, the governor gave us 60 days to come up with a new education plan for the state of Michigan. We were working around the clock. And Doug said to me at the end of that period, he said, you know something? We're gonna look back on this period as one of the highlights of our career. It's hard work, but it's rewarding work because you can really make a difference sometimes when you're in that kind of position. And you were right. Doug said something else about that time. He said, I was never on a championship sports team, but when you get to do good work in public service, you feel like you're in the Super Bowl. It is absolutely true. Great story. A great story, Doug. And I'd like to give you three a uh, little token of our appreciation. You all get a Ralph Cowenstein tote bag 
uh, for your uh, appearance here today and enlightening us so much. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Appreciate it very much. And good travels back to Florida and back to Lansing. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gvsu.edu.